Alrighty guys, so last time we talked about the rejection region, how to find that using the significance level. And also, um, just basically in general, that those are stuff that happens across all different types of hypothesis tests. Now we're going to move on to parts that are basically different across each one. And the three different types we're going to focus on are three points that we also focus on when we were talking about sampling distributions, which was the large sample with the mean, which we did Z, right, when we created those confidence intervals and things like that. Small sample, we used T and then proportions, which is just naturally large sample. So those are the three we're going to work on. Let's go ahead and start on with our large sample. So large sample across the mean. So back when we talked about sampling distribution, again, we had Z or T statistics, right? And so we used the Z when we had samples that were larger than 30, right? And then otherwise, you use the T calculation. So right up here, I have kind of a breakdown of other things that we've seen um, across other the other videos that we've already done. So we have the null and alternative hypotheses, right? So H A H A. We have the Z C and T C, which I call them the T the critical values, right? So we have a Z critical or a T critical, depending on what type of problem we're dealing with. Um, Z or T, without the little C, I'm gonna to refer to those as our test statistics. So we're gonna have test statistics without the C's. And then critical values are the ones that do have the C's. And then alpha is gonna be our significance level. So just like before, so those are all our formulas. I mean, um, those are all our variables, and we're going to see those across the next couple of pages just to make sure that we got that down. Um, and if you do forget, it's going to be right there for you to see. So for samples that are larger than, larger than or equal to 30, the test statistic is calculated using the following formula. So it should look pretty familiar, right? And so here we have a Z, which is just the sample mean minus the mean. So you see that mu with a little zero there? Some people may call it mu naught, but that's a very math way of saying it. All I'm really going to say is that you see like HO, there's a mu O, right? So our null, so these values here with a little O across from them, and we're also going to see that in the small sample and also proportions. So when you see that little O, just think, looks like my null hypothesis, my HO, so that's the number that I'm using. So that mu naught comes from my null hypothesis, and then divided by our measure of spread, right? So again, it's always just going to be the sample minus the mean divided by some measure of spread. Um, so again, like I said, the breakdown here is that the mu with a little o there comes from our HO. And then the standard error of the mean is um, the standard deviation divided by square root n, just like we've seen before. And now x bar is sample mean. Um, standard deviation of the sample means is technically called the standard error of the sample means. And then we have n is our sample size. So again, we've already figured out how to do the rejection region, right? So now we need to see where our test statistic lies in relation to that. And again, that test statistic is the part, only really part that varies across different types of problems. Um, so all you need to do is go ahead and calculate where that test statistic must lie in order for you to say, and I'm sorry, that rejection region is where that test statistic must lie in order for you to say that you found a sample as extreme as you did was not likely due to chance. So basically, if this number falls at the rejection region point or any further, that sample is like way too far off for, you, for it to just have been due to chance, right? So there's always going to be some variability. If there's a mean in the middle, there's going to be obviously some sample means that fall a little below, a little above. But then again, we created that rejection region for us to let us know where if it's past that point, that's when it's too far and it's not likely due to chance. And therefore, we reject the null hypothesis, which was our status quo, what we thought was the mean of our population. Right? So this is where we would reject HO. So now let's go ahead and do a quick problem. Um, and I'm going to do one example just because they're very hefty. So there's a lot of math involved, a lot of work involved. So just to save us some time, I'm going to do one example. But we're going to have quite a few practice problems for us to work with. So some researchers think that there's reason to believe that within the United States, average sex activity has increased um, since 2000. So for whatever reason, you know, there's um, music videos and just stuff on the internet and all that stuff so people just have become desensitized to the idea of sex and so maybe it's increased um, so we have reason to believe that it's changed in 2000 people were having sex four times a week on average totally made up obviously um, you collect a random sample of 64 Americans and find a mean and standard deviation of 5.2 and 8 conduct a hypothesis test using an alpha of 0.05 so here I go ahead and gave you a little hint um, and if you want, you can feel free to use that every single time. So it's kind of just like a step-by-step -step just to make sure that you get everything um, correctly done. So first off is our null and alternative hypotheses, right? So I'm literally going to go ahead and number it out and say null and alternative hypotheses. So we have reason to believe that um, activity has increased since 2000, right? So we're going to go ahead and say that that's our claim. We're establishing that 
it maybe has increased. It's increased compared to four times a week back in 2000, right? So it's increased, and then our alter our null is the opposite, right? So less than or equal to. And they said that our alpha is 0.05. But we don't really know what to do with that alpha yet until we decide what tail we're looking at, right? And so which one tells us which tail we're going to be focusing on? The alternate, right? So this little guy there. We look at that sign from the alternate for it to tell us what side of the, the normal distribution we're going to be focusing on, right? Left, right, or two tail? In this case, it's telling us, let's look at the right. All right, and so here we go. What's the area of that little tail right there? It's going to be our alpha, right? Full blast, right? Because it's not a two tail problem, so we don't have to split that alpha into two. So it's full blast 0.05. And now what do we do from here? Let's go ahead and get our rejection region, right? So in this case, are we dealing with Z, T? And actually, there's another option, right? Not yet. We're not there yet. So we're dealing with Z or T. It's going to be Z because we have a sample of 64, right? So our Z critical is based off of what? It's 0.5 minus some area, right? Since we're not splitting our alpha into two, it's just the full alpha. So it's 0.5 minus 0.05 equals 0.45. And that gives us, once we look that up in our table, so let's go ahead and scroll down real quick and see what that gives us. 0.45. So 4.5, again, we've seen this multiple times. 4,500 is somewhere in between these two, so it's between 1.64 and 1.65, aka 1.645, right? So let's go ahead and go back up. And actually, let's see if we have our little cheat table has it. And it does. So here you see um, alpha is alpha or alpha over two. And again, that's up to you, right? So you decide whether you're doing a one or a two tail. So if it's one tail, it all goes there, which is the case that we're dealing with here. So our one tail had an alpha of 0.05. And so Z is 1.645. So if you are able to use this table, Go ahead and give yourself some little shortcuts so you don't have to do this every single time. As long as you understand what you're doing, and really you do have to understand in order for you to use these shortcuts, um, there's not really a problem with using them. So 1.645, so here we go. That is our rejection region now, right? So anything past here is where we're going to decide to reject. And now, Here's our zero point, right? So the middle is always going to be zero. So here, from here on out, I'm not really going to write what the x corresponds to. I'm just going to stick to what the z says. So we got a z critical of 1.645. We got our null and alternate. Now our next step is to get the test statistic, right? So step three, our test stat. So z is x bar minus the mean divided by the standard error. We don't have the standard error yet, so wait, let's go ahead and get that real quick. So standard deviation over square root n. So standard deviation was 8 divided by the square root of, we had 64 Americans in our sample, so our standard error is 1. Very pretty. <laughs> it's not always going to be that nice. Um, so our z is, we had a mean of, and so here, our sample mean is the first one, right? So 5.2 minus the mean from the null hypothesis, right? So this little guy here is coming from, well, my null says is the status quo, right? So again, it's kind of just the general idea is that if I got a sample with this number, how far from it is, is that from the status quo? If it's too far off, then we reject the null hypothesis because if we're way far off, that means that our null, our null or what we thought was the status quo or that mu not is probably not correct. Does that make sense? So 5.2 minus 4 divided by standard error of 1. So our z is 1.2 over 1 is 1.2. Now, what we do with that is go ahead and see where that 1.2 lies um, with respect to our distribution, right? 
So we got 5.2 minus the 4 divided by 1. And so that 1.2 lies within our um, non-rejection region, right? So technically not in the rejection region. So what we go ahead and say is that And I'm going to write it like this for the first time, but from here on out, I'm really just going to write FTR or R. So that represents fail to reject or reject. Oh, let me go ahead and remove myself so you can see that. So since our 1.2 lies within outside of the rejection region, right? So if it's in the rejection region, we reject. If it's outside of that, we fail to reject. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and fail to reject our null hypothesis, right? So that's about it for our um, test statistic for the large sample. So just a quick recap, go ahead and write the null and alternate hypotheses. Um, next, from that, you decide what side you're focusing on, right? You need to know which side you're focusing on so that you can say, am I splitting my alpha into two or not? From there, get your critical value, which in this case, if you have a large sample, it's gonna be Z's, right? Um, and then from there, you get your Z statistic to see where your sample lies in relation to all of this madness, assuming that your null is true, right? And so that's the whole purpose of this, is that you assume that the null is correct, the status quo is true. If I got a sample this far off, is it too far off for me to say that the null is true, and therefore I reject? So we got our Z was 1.2, decided is it in the rejection region or not, and it's not, so we um, decided to fail to reject. And again, I'm just gonna go ahead and highlight that rejection region for us to know that that particular point right there, from there up, is where we reject the null hypothesis. So let's go ahead and move on to some practice problems to make sure we got all this stuff down. Um, and then after that, we're going to move on to our small samples.